Salutations, everyone! Welcome back to another Total Warhammer 3 guide. I'm Lord Forant, and today we will be covering the Vampire Coast. So the Vampire Coast plays very similar to the Vampire Count, um, but with range. Um, this video will be divided into several sections that will all be chaptered below, so you can click to skip to what you want. We'll cover the faction concepts, how they play, moving on into their units, their economy, followed by their technology, and then the various lords and starting locations with some strategy for each of them. And before we get too deep into it, if you enjoy the video or it helps you in any way, please do leave like a like, a comment, or subscribe, ring the little bell. Uh, I do appreciate hearing strategies and other stuff. So let's jump right into it. So as I said, the Vampire Count is kind of, the Vampire Coast is similar to the Vampire Counts, but they're ranged. In fact, they're pretty much vampire pirates taken right out of something like Pirates of the Caribbean, kind of. Um, being vampires, it means they have access to the standard raised dead ability of the vampiric factions. Uh, it's not as good, in my opinion, as the Vampire Counts one. It doesn't seem to, at the moment, build up with vampiric corruption getting you access to the higher level units. I don't know if that's a bug or it's just my game, but I can't see any indication that uh, it does get better with that. Um, like the Vampire Counts do, so it's a bit different in that sense. Now, the next thing to talk about for the Vampire Counts is their semi-horde faction. So while the Vampire Coast can own settlements, and they're decent settlements, they get access to almost all their buildings in the settlements, and they can make decent money from them. Um, including uh, their capitals get access to basically everything. They also function as a quasi-horde. Um, this is centered around their shipbuilding mechanic, which is basically a horde ability. So you'll see we have the normal leader here, Count Noctis, but he can recruit units even though we're not in our own territory. That is because over here you'll see the shipbuilding panel, and this functions similar to the other horde ones. You can upgrade it, you can build a variety of buildings. You can, in fact, build almost, I think, all of their buildings um, upgraded here. The only one I'm not seeing is the Necrofax Colossus, which um, is unfortunate. But uh, you can build most of their really good units all the way up to their depth guards and everything else from these. And uh, just be aware that it uses this growth mechanic here. So everything you build costs um, a growth the amount it says to keep building initially once it's built costs money to upgrade you also need growth to go up cool thing to note here is you can get negative 20 upkeep in these um combined with one of these here you can get another 15 so your army can be 35 um, percent cheaper to maintain than it would appear ah there's the necrofax colossus it's tucked away under there uh, you can also get buildings that increase casualty replenishment recruit rate this one over here, Heavy Ballast, is probably one of the first ones you want to build because it increases the growth of your pirate crew. And you can also get movement range, uh, replenishment, and spread corruption. Um, this is a very powerful mechanic because the Vampire Coast is, how shall we say, not the world's best at fighting directly. Um, they're not going to really be capable of taking on multiple armies till the late game, meaning... They spend a lot of time running around raiding and pillaging, um, which is fine. Anything on the coast, they're really good at attacking. And uh, their lords have this ability called Sea Dogs here, which gives you more leadership while fighting at sea and more money from sacking settlements, meaning the entire coastline anywhere in the world can be your prey. The downside is everybody hates you, basically. Um, even factions like the Norska hate you. The only people who are going to get along with you is the Vampire Counts, and um, other vampire coast lords, sometimes um, the tomb kings, but basically everybody else hates you and wants you dead at any time. So one thing that you're going to be spending a lot of time doing as the vampire coast is obviously raiding and pillaging. Now, when you raid or pillage a settlement, inland works like normal. If you go to the coast, though, when you take a settlement, you'll be given another option. It'll be it up here. I think it's the second option. It will be called Establish a Pirate Cove. Now, what this is, is basically it's like a Skaven Undercity, but it can't be detected. 
and it has a variety of effects. You have access to four buildings, one of which is gain infamy per turn. We'll talk about that after. Recruit rank on your lords and an improved capacity for two of your heroes, which is all very nice. You get 20 of these, you'll be recruiting immortal lords like there's no tomorrow. Over here, more infamy, but big vampire corruption spreading, plus five and then three. You stick one of these in an area, that area is going to turn at least partially vampiric. You stick two in a region, it's a vampire province, even though you might not own it. Now be aware, if you occupy the settlement, you lose the vampire. Um, well, the hidden hold here, basically, the Vampire Pirate Cove. But um, the enemies can't destroy it outside of actually raising the settlement. Meaning, given time, you can build up a huge network of these hidden coves throughout the map, spreading corruption and gaining infamy. Now, say you want to make money from them. You've got two options. One gives you a flat income per turn, infamy, boost in research rate, which is quite nice, and income from trade. Now, the trade, the only people, as I said, you're going to be able to really trade with are the other vampiric pirates. And in my experience, their survival rate is lower than you would expect going into the late game. On the other hand, you have access to the Picaroon's Hideout. Now, this might be one of my favorite little buildings in the game. A reasonable amount of infamy, but income gain from local settlements income 50%. If you sneak this into, say, the High Elf city of Lotharin here, when it's fully upgraded, or um, Erengrad, or um, Marienburg, or any of the large, powerful coastal settlements, and then toss down this, you can make like a thousand plus gold a turn from them. It's absolutely great. Um, just don't throw it down in minor settlements. Um, if you, they don't have more than uh, 400 income in the settlement, you're better off with a smuggler's cove. And honestly, uh, this one is used to prep land for your invasion. This one's used long term to gain infamy and get more heroes. But most of the time, what you're going to probably use is either Smuggler's Cove or Picaroon's Hideout, obviously, depending on the settlement, and then a lot of Corrupted Taverns. The reason I recommend Corrupted Taverns over the Lord Recruitment Rate and Capacity is the Vampire Coast is not the world's best faction on either offense or defense. So having the vampiric corruption in the land to soften up the enemies helps a lot. They have, of course, the vampiric corruption, which gives them various bonus points. And they now have the dead rise again, meaning once a battle's over, there's a chance for your dead units to be resurrected. And yes, this actually does apply to one of the vampire coasts or infamous units, the bloated corpse, which explodes doing a massive amount of damage, but now there's a chance you get it back, um, which is really handy early game, and in general is a very nice buff for this faction. Now, there are a couple other mechanics, so let's talk about those. The first one up here is Infamy. So this might get reworked. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it does, but this is based off of the Total Warhammer 2 Vortex race, the very separate one for the Vampire Coast, where basically you want to get your infamy up, your reputation among for evilness and piracy things built up. As you would build it up, you'd get access to various different enemies here. And once you defeat these, you will unlock sea shanties. The sea shanties have a variety of power. For example, this one, reload melee defense, hits everything on the map for 30 seconds. These are some pretty powerful boosts to your actual army. Um, previously you had to get them all and then get a special harpoon to win the campaign. Now you don't, um, you can still get obviously these verses, but that's why I think it's going to change because it's no longer needed, uh, the way it was. Suffice to say, building infamy is important. It allows you to, um, obviously get higher up in those rankings. You also will use it for recruiting the these legendary lords here, uh, legendary admirals, they call them. So while the Vampire Coast has four distinct legendary lords, they also have these legendary admirals under tech. They cost 2,000 infamy to recruit, but they stay loyal. And that is another thing we should mention here. So Vampire Count Coast, I'm going to say Vampire Counts more than I mean to, just know I mean the Vampire Coast, have a loyalty mechanic. If loyalty hits zero, they will defect with their army and attempt to form a new faction. Um, thankfully, unlike the other factions, it's very clear how you get loyalty built back up. Recruiting or fighting, smuggling, plundering, 
starting fire, raising settlements, and getting battles. Uh, while this is great to know how you get the loyalty up early on, if you can, you want to get these legendary ones since they will not defect. Um, the 2000 infamy is rather steep, but you can get up there pretty quickly, especially if you get several pirate coves giving you 20 plus or so a turn. So you can also establish pirate coves another way rather than invading with an army. You can recruit a hero unit, um, which I don't have access to at this point, but it's the Vampire Fleet Captain. They have a special hero action against the settlement to establish a pirate cove. Now be aware, once they do one, there's a penalty imposed on them where they can't make another pirate cove for a series of turns. I think it's 20. And the cost rises for any other pirate coves established during that turn, that time period, by another vampire uh, fleet captain. That's to prevent you from getting them everywhere early on. Um, it's pretty effective at slowing you down initially, so don't expect to have massive amounts of them early game. But late game, it's worth having two or three vampire fleet captains running around the map establishing coves uh, rather than being in your armies. And of course, the more you establish, the more infamy you get. Getting these legendary admirals early on, getting one of them is really all you're going to need for the early game. Uh, one to defend, one to attack. Usually you use your legendary lord, like Noctilus or the others, to attack you. Now, they have two other mechanics here, or three rather, that we'll talk about. The first one is fleet offices. If you get lords of a certain rank, you can assign them to various offices, where they give bonuses to your faction. The top line is effective at really um, buffing your armies faction-wide. The bottom line, while it does boost faction-wide, it is a little bit more focused on the army. So I'm not going to go into these because it's pretty self-explanatory what they do. Um, this is guns. This is monsters, constructs, etc. And um, I will make a special mention for the fleet engineer here. This is probably the one you're going to want to throw in your lord to first. The research rate is really nice. The construction cost and the pirate growth is really handy. Earlier in the game, you get it. Um, and there's quite a few other techs you're going to want to snag, but I recommend this is the first office that you use your lord on. Next, the Vampire Coast has access to the rights of Total Warhammer 2. There's a couple um, here that are really powerful. Uh, first off, this one, this Curse Miss causing attrition to enemies and Vanguard deployment for a lot of your units. This is quite handy because, as I said, the Vampire Coast are not necessarily the strongest combat faction, at least on defense or offense. Your garrisons in particular are not particularly that good. This will uh, allow you to be way more defensive, hurting the enemy army, so hopefully your garrisons can hold up. Be aware, though, that there are some factions who are immune to attrition, and... Uh, a lot of the legendary lords are still quite capable of killing your garrison, even if they are weakened. The Curse of Eternal Service. Chance of boosting loyalty and control. Honestly, I can't remember the any time I've ever used this one, um, either in Total Warhammer 2 or 3 now. Uh, it's just... It's, it serves its purpose. If you're having trouble with loyalty, though, something's bigger is going wrong that you're not going to solve with a single right. However... Despite how bad that one right is, the last two make up for it. So this one right here, the Queen Bess, is a monstrously powerful artillery unit. Now, once you hit rank 10, you can perform it. It gives you access to recruit it into your faction. And it gives you a massive casualty replenishment boost if you needed it. Basically, you're going to want a late game. You're going to want one to two Queen Besses in every army because they're so strong. Um... They're probably one of the most powerful artillery, if not the strongest artillery unit in the game. Uh, and the fact that you have to use a right to get them with a cooldown of 25 turns um, tells you how important they really are. Now, I think they could be buffed a bit, but they're already pretty strong. And this last one, Curse of the Bountiful Treasure, is a free right here. Just be aware of that, so you can cast it pretty much every time it's off cooldown. It gives you 500 gold for every building owned from the Buried Treasure Chain. You have to build three plunder, plunder pile buildings to get it. So while this is somewhat more into economy, I will point out it does not apply to the minor settlements building. It only applies to the major settlements plunder pile building here. 
So you basically have to own three capital settlements and build these. And while the economy is not that great, considering you can cast that right every 15 or so turns and get 500 from these, since you have to have three, that's 1,500, not including the income you're gaining every turn. Uh, it's a very nice boost to your economy. Not that the Vampire Coast really struggles with money. Okay, let's talk about a, a very interesting mechanic. These are the treasure maps of the Vampire Coast. You'll get them after battles or other stuff. Um, they provide different bonuses. You have to go to these areas, solve the riddle. Um, and once you track it down, you have to then find it. Um, it's hidden on the map. You have to be within a reasonably close radius to the area. There is a unique stance solely for that purpose, which I will show you. Here we go. It's called Dig for Treasure. Uh, it consumes all remaining movement range, but there's a chance of finding a treasure map. So obviously we failed here. Now, I will point out the fact that we've used up all our movement range, but we can still shift into the encamp stance. So if you dig for treasure, immediately shift out of that into the encampment um, in case you get attacked, but also if you need to replenish your units. Plus, you can then recruit. Easier. And there is another one here, but let's finish up the riddles. Basically, solving these puzzles can be difficult. It's not a bad thing to use a guide to solve some of them. They can get rather complex, but most of them are straightforward. They provide a varying amount of rewards. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, you can see their rewards based on their missions. Some give a great hoard of treasure. It's like 4,000, I think, of gold. Some that give miserly, it's like 500. In my opinion, it's almost always worth discarding the miserly ones. You'll get enough um, of these treasure maps that you don't have to go do bad ones. So, for example, you go here and you abandon it. You can only hold five, I believe, treasure maps at once. Meaning, if you have bad ones, don't expect to get good ones until you get rid of um, some of them. And be aware, you don't have to complete these missions. Like, I don't have to go down here and do this. I can just simply discard this one as well. And um, I'll get another treasure map after a battle, or sometimes you'll get it rather from turns. So there is this pieces of eight. So this is similar to the um, Books of Nagash mechanic. Scattered around the map, there are um, pieces of eight owned by other legendary pirates. Now, be aware, these factions are listed here they are very strong they are very very strong uh, so don't expect to complete many of them early on but once you defeat these lords in battle they tend to survive most of the game in my experience uh, just because of how strong their army are once you defeat them you unlock a variety of regiments of renowned they're scattered around the map they're pretty powerful some of the ones you get i particularly like um this one for the rotting Prometheans and the deck guard, deck guard with pole arms. Those are extraordinarily powerful ones. You just got to go track it down, defeat the army. Thankfully, you always have uh, vision. Well, not vision, but you can always zoom to where the army is to let you know where to find them. I will point out that if you do the Queen Bess ritual, she appears under the Regiment of Renown tab at the end here. Just so that you know. Okay, let's talk about units. So, obviously the Vampire Coast has access to the Raise the Undead, and you're going to want to use that to rebuild your army since it recruits instantly. But um, they have a vast variety of other units, mostly centered around range. So before we get into it, let's look at the Queen Bess here, um, just because uh, I mentioned it recently. So here it is. You'll notice it's got a massive range. Not the most damage, but it is armor piercing and it does slow enemies it hits. It has a bonus making it do more damage when it has lots of ammunition. It doesn't have the world's greatest amount of ammunition, but with the monster's impact, the armor piercing, and the fire, anything it hits is going to get so slowed that it usually can keep bombarding it uh, time after time, which is really powerful. It doesn't have the world's fastest firing, but backed up by the other Vampire Coast units, it's one of the... Um, more solid artillery units of the game. That range is huge considering how early you get it. Um, while it doesn't do the single most damage, the fact that it slows enemies and you can constantly keep hitting them over and over from this massive range 
still makes it one of the better artillery units. So as you'll see, Vampire Coast has access to a vast variety of things. This one here is um, specific to two of the legendary lords, so we'll talk about that later. So let's get into it. We will use, actually, let's use the actual building one here, just so you can see the built difference between the building tree and the horde tree. So first off, you have your barracks unit, which gives you access to basically your zombie mob unit. Uh, while these are better than the Vampire Count Zombies, they're not going to win in any type of melee combat, except basically zombies. Uh, they're pretty well trash. They have a ton of hit points, though, so they serve their role of meat shield very well. Their job is to hold the front line for the Vampire Coast's range units to obliterate things. Moving up, we have access to the Scurvy Dogs. This is basically a Hellhound unit. Um, they're fast. They're a little bit better at melee attack. They won't hold a line at all with their low hit points. They'll also die to range almost immediately. They're good early on for running off artillery. Honestly, I don't even find that they usually can drive off a single unit of archers. Um, so definitely one of my least favorite dog units in the game. Now, you also have access at the same point to the deckhands mob with pole arms. This, in my opinion, is a general flat upgrade from the deckhands mob without pole arms. Uh, it has increased melee defense, meaning its meat shieldness lasts longer, and it is armor piercing, uh, which in general means it holds up better against everything. It might actually kill some units, um, although that's very unlikely. Further on, now we get access to the elite, uh, <laughs> elite it being a relative term, of the Vampire Coast. You get access to the Depth Guard. Now, if you play Total Warhammer 1, be aware that the Depth Guard and Depth Guard with Pull Arms receive a boost, plus with the healing, this is a much better unit than it used to be, and it was already pretty decent. It's got good combat stats. It's still not the world's strongest infantry unit. It will lose against most uh, equivalent infantry units of their rank, but it does have the Hunger and Frenzy here, so it will heal in combat, and it's got a huge boost if its leadership is high. Um, this might be a good point to mention that all the Vampire Coast units have seen a leadership boost from Total Warhammer 2 um, to bring them in line with the demon factions. So it's a little bit harder to make them start to crumble than they used to be. And they're also almost all undead units, so they will die rather than routing. Just be aware of that. Um, these guys will actually be able to kill things. They're pretty decent at combat. But overall, they're outclassed by their upgrade, the Vampire Depth Guard with Pole Arms. These are, of course, similar in stats, less melee attack, significantly more melee defense, and their armor piercing. Overall, once you get this, train these over these, they're, they'll, you'll thank me. They're much better. They can actually kill cav units, and they can hold the line against most infantry factions long enough for your range to kill things. Now. The next line is your basic range. This uh, start rather weak, but build up quickly. So the first level here, gunnery mob, medium, low level of medium range. Um, they do decent me melee uh, missile strength, and they have a good amount of armor. You'll notice that their melee attack and defense are trash, meaning they will die to anything that closes with them. Even zombie units will kill them, pretty much. Uh, they do get a boost to damage early on, while they have a lot of ammunition. And overall, their job is to get two or three shots off onto the enemy. The problem is, once they get those two or three shots off, the enemy is usually closed with them, and they're dead. Overall, worth building early on, but are very quickly outclassed by their various upgrades. So now the next one is a gunnery mob with bombs. This is a huge buff um, to their combat strength. They throw bombs at a much lower range. The bombs actually really hurt. Um, they have a limited amount of shots, though. But uh, you bring three or four of these to the battle behind a line of your zombie deckhand mobs, and they will chuck bombs, and they will do some serious damage. The next one we've got here is the zombie pirate's gunnery mob. So this is your first really good range unit. It's still not amazing, but it serves its purpose. It's got a longer range than the lower levels, and it has armor-piercing missile strength, but it got on par with 
most archers in terms of the range damage it can do. Be aware that it is a handgun unit, so it does not fire in an arc. In fact, almost none of the Vampire Coast factions fire in an arc. They're all straight line, meaning if your units are standing between them and the enemy, they can't shoot, and they won't shoot, meaning you have to set up lanes of fire. I'm not going to go into how to set that up for battle. Uh, go watch some other people's guides. There's a lot more people who understand the Vampire Coast and how to fight with them in combat than I do. Uh, they're very tricky to figure out, but they can be quite powerful once you do. Still doesn't mean they're as good as some of the other factions, in my opinion. And then following up, you have the gunnery mobs. These are hand cannons, uh, closer range, more damage. Uh, they get three or four shots off most, and then they're usually closed on. I honestly like the handgun gunnery mob unit better just because of the range. But, but used properly, the damage here is substantial. Now this gives access to the gunnery white hero unit, and I will mention that after we're done the rest of the units, because this is a very important unit for the Vampire Coast. Uh, it's a ranged sniping hero unit, decent ammo, good combat strength. Big purpose is to snipe lords or uh, monstrous or constructs from a distance. And finally at the top, you have the rotting Prometheans gunnery mob. Short range, good damage, but can actually fight in melee combat once they use up all their shots, uh, which is quite nice. They're a siege attacker if for some reason you needed that at this point. Uh, it's kind of a shame they come so late to the battlefield, but they are very good at doing um, their job. I just find there's better ranged units, and there's also better melee units for this faction, but go ahead, use them. See how you feel about them. Now, we've got the flying tree. These are trash units, these fell bats. They're basically sole purpose is to fly over the enemy, frighten them. They will lose in melee combat versus a lot of stuff. They actually have decent melee defense, but it doesn't really solve their very low hit points, no armor, and uh, the fact they can't really kill things. Bring maybe one or two of these, but honestly, if you don't start with them, there's really no reason to train them except to fill out your army. Overall, they're just absolutely bad unit. Further on, we've got the Dex Droppers, which are a flying pistol cavalry. So this is kind of odd. They fly over the battlefield and they shoot kind of down at an angle at them. Uh, thankfully, it means it's much easier to get them to actually attack than some of these because your own units don't really get in the way. They do decent damage. Um, they've got good flying ability and afterwards they can actually fight half decently. They die both versus most other flying units. And if they get shot by range units, they die super fast. Um, it might actually be worth bringing a couple of these to the battle if you're struggling to get uh, fire lines available, fire lanes. Further up, we've got access to some stronger ones. We've got ones with bombs. Uh, I really like this unit because bombs are pretty strong. This buffs them even higher. Um, I still don't build many of them, but it's worth bringing one or two if, again, you're struggling with uh, holding the line or hitting the enemy. Further on, you've got Flying Missile Cavalry with handguns. Now, you can build this unit, and it has its purpose, but honestly, I almost would go with the cheaper gunnery mob unit, just because if this thing gets shot by any range units, it's going down. And while it does have a very nice range damage and can pound the enemy from a distance, it does have a lower entity size, meaning it's not as many shots at once. It has its purpose. Um... If you're not fighting anything that can absolutely wreck you at range, uh, it's worth using. If you are fighting people with long range units, this unit is rather trashy at that point. And finally, at the top, we have the Death Shriek Terror Guides. So this is pretty much their dragon unit. Uh, it's got a breath attack, a Death Shriek. Uh, Causes terror as well as fear. It does regenerate. It's overall a very powerful melee fighter. You throw it into the enemy outside of lords or heroes, not much is going to be able to kill it. It's a pretty decent flying unit. You can drop it on their back line, their archers or their artillery. They're gone instantly. Then you can charge into the back of the enemy ranks. Uh, it's overall a really good unit. Once you get it, it's worth bringing one or two to battle. Further on, we now get into some of the more entertaining and stronger Vampire Coast units. Their other units here, despite their advantages, are pretty well outclassed by the next three trees we're going to cover. 
So the first one here is your artillery one. And I will note here, it does unlock an army ability, uh, which is basically almost like a spell casting one. You can use it twice. It's worth bringing to the battlefield. Um, it won't kill many things, but it does weaken the enemy. And as you uh, upgrade, you'll unlock more of them. Uh, they do stack, so you can have quite a few of these. Meaning this is actually a very good defensive building, let alone what it recruits. So it recruits a mortar, which has got decent range and good missile strength. I find it tends to be less accurate than I would like. Um, but early on, bringing artillery with a long range to a battle is always worth it. You get it at level 2, meaning you can recruit artillery pretty much long before any other faction can do so. Bring one or two to your battles early game. Replace them with your stronger range artillery later on. So the next one we get is the Carronades, which is a very long range siege artillery. So the difference here is these mortars fire an arc. These guys fire straight, um, meaning setting them up can be difficult. Vampire coasts rely heavily on hills where you put your range units on the top so they can fire down while your infantry holds below. That is a perfect position for these. These function like your standard real world cannons, basically. Um, Long range, good damage, still outclassed by Queen Bess, but that's intentional. Um, the only problem I see sometimes is actually hitting the enemy. You can command this yourself, so you can aim with them. It can be rather difficult to use, but overall, I like them a bit better than the mortars, in my opinion. Uh, they're armor piercing with a longer range. It's worth bringing two or three of these to the battle. Honestly, if you bring five or six artillery units to the battle, you're not doing a bad thing as the Vampire Coast, so long as you can protect them. Uh, their artillery is very powerful, and since now that you outrange the enemy, you force them to come to you. Up at the top here, we have the Deck Gunners. This is very similar to the Skaven Gunner unit. Once you get this, most of your other earlier range units are outclassed, uh, not including artillery. It's got a long range, it's an armor piercing, unique missile here. It's a shield breaker, meaning it's hard for the enemies to defend. It penetrates units, it does a lot of damage. Overall, it is a superior um, range unit to pretty much anything you've brought to the battlefield before. Given time and the ability to fire at the enemy, they will um, wipe out units. The downside is they die in melee combat, and if the enemy has stock, Stock is pretty much like the ultimate counter to the Vampire Coast because then you can't shoot the enemy at range. They'll get close to you. Um, just be aware of that. But otherwise, bring these units. This will be your gun line. I still recommend bringing some infantry, though, to keep the enemy off of them. If you get a flank with these, as in your infantry is holding a line and you get these to the side, firing in the enemies from either behind or the side, they will absolutely wreck enemy units. It's hilarious to watch. The difficulty is pulling that off. Now, we'll get into the monstrous constructs. So the first one is the bloated corpse unit. This might be one of my favorite units in the game. Uh, it basically runs into the enemy, and if you look at the abilities, causes damage to self. Once it runs out all its hit points, it explodes. As you'll see, it does a massive up to 2660 damage. Uh, the chance that you can get these revived after battles now is just amazing. Uh, although, pity whoever has to put them back together, right? Uh, it's a great unit. can be used very effectively on AIs. Players will be aware that you have these, though, and so they'll be very cautious. Um, you can hide them very well in the forest and then charge out so you can get some nice ambush. Be aware if... You do not protect these or use them properly. The AI and the any players will target them because they're so strong. Um, and it does a, a decent radius blast. It moves pretty quickly, actually, for an explosive unit. And once you charge in, you it blows up, does a lot of damage, can wipe entire regiments of elite infantry. It's extraordinarily powerful. A hero that gets hit with this is might not be dead, but they've lost a lot of their hit points. And then you have access to the animated Holtz. These are considered a monstrous infantry unit, despite being much larger than your average infantry. Low entity, pretty decent at actually killing things and holding a line. I prefer the death, depth guards, but you get these a lot earlier. Um, I mean, actually one of your few melee units that can kill things. 
um, meaning they have their purpose in the lineup. Further on, you have access to the Morngul Hunter um, hero unit. This is a pretty powerful melee hero. It's got your standard combat abilities, but it also has the hunger, so it regens hit points. It slows enemy in an area. You can make it partially ethereal, meaning it has physical resistance. It does chill attacks, slowing enemy's movement even further. Overall, it's a great melee unit. It's a large entity unit, meaning it actually hits more enemies than just one when it attacks. Um, all told, a fully built up Morngul Hunter might be one of my favorite um, heroes to use in melee. Um, they're very powerful. Uh, they do die relatively quickly to uh, legendary lords, so just be aware of that. But against anything else, they can hold their own. Um, very good at killing trash infantry. Or holding a front line so your gunners can shoot. The next ones, we have access to the Rotting Prometheans. Honestly, it's kind of an upgraded from the animated hulks. Better combat stats, better weapons. It's tier 3. It's very good at pinning down the enemy, holding a line. Um, not necessarily killing anything, but not dying either. Uh, once you get this, this should comprise a good portion of your front line that's not depth guards. The next one is the Morngul's unit rather than the hero. These ones, despite how much I love the Morngul haunters, uh, these are less effective than I would like. I think they need a buff. Uh, they do regen, they do decent melee attack, low melee defense. Honestly, they die a lot faster than I would like. They remind me a lot of the Banshees unit from the Vampire Counts, where it should be better on paper than it is in actuality. Now, the regen helps quite a bit. Um, Decent combat stats, but they're not as good as the Morngul Hunter hero unit is, in my opinion. They have their purpose, though. They get some great flanks. They stalk, meaning you can use them to sneak behind enemy lines and charge from behind. They cause fear, as do most of the vampire units. Um, they're actually pretty good at running off archers, and even fighting Cav, they're decent. Then you have the Sirens. Um, this is similar to the Morngul Hunters. They do charms, they weaken the enemies, magic attacks. They are ethereal meaning they have a massive amount of physical resistance the problem is with the increase with a lot of magic and other um, spells and stuff that provide magic attack they've actually in my opinion been nerfed a bit um their combat stats aren't the world's best but they are hard to kill in melee combat except if the enemy has magical attacks in which case they die super fast uh, the charm is nice for weakening the enemy, though, but it does not make up for their low melee attack on their own. I prefer them over the Morngol units. Um, figure out which one you prefer. One's large, one's smaller, but has more units. And then at the top, we have access to the Rotting Leviathan. So this is a rather powerful unit. It's got a ton of ammunition and good range. Uh, it's a one entity unit. You want to put this on the battlefield, it will barrage the enemy um, a lot. It has a reasonably fast and powerful fire time. Be aware that its missile damage isn't the stronger, strongest, um, but it's got decent combat stats for when the enemy closes. It's worth bringing one or two of these, but honestly, it's outclassed by the final unit we're going to talk about here, the Necrofex Colossus. So this... There's quite a few memes of playing Count Noctis and having an army of Noctis and 19 of these units for a reason. They have a massive range. They do a large amount of missile damage, and they're actually good in combat. These are a very powerful artillery unit. In fact, when it hits the late game, they pretty much can obsolete any of your uh, other ranged units in the game outside of some of your artillery. Uh, they have the ability to summon a zombie pirate deckhands mob to defend them, uh, which is quite cool because if they throw that down in front of them, uh, they will gain some protection and delay the enemy so that the other Necrofex Colossuses can kill them. Now, if you're going to use this, and you should, uh, be aware that Count Noctis has bonuses towards using these. Um, that's kind of his big focus thing. And in fact, his capital region here has a building that gives plus four rank and more combat strength for them, which is kind of cool. Okay, let's look at the, that's the, those are the units, by the way, um, outside of the uh, regiments of renown. So let's look at the gunnery white. 
So the Gunnery White is almost a necessity in Vampire Count's armies, in my opinion. Um, they're just such a powerful um, support hero. So the first thing they have is they've got decent range and missile strength, meaning they're pretty good at killing things at a distance, good at targeting lords and heroes. They have this access to these cackle fruits, which are a... They throw a bomb. <laughs> basically, it's a magic missile thing, but it's basically a grenade. They throw it, explodes. It does pretty decent damage. They can use it multiple times, uh, and they can even um, upgrade it later on with this utility belt, allow them to use it more often. They also have this Pyromaniac, which replaces their Bomb Throw ability, which they have as well. Um, so you get Cackle Fruit and you get Bomb Throw, meaning these guys come with grenades and they throw a lot of them. Now, Pyromaniac is an upgrade to it, so you get even more powerful damage and it burns the enemy as well. Uh, don't underestimate how strong this is at causing damage. Um, it's very powerful. Now, why else am I talking about these? Well, it's this line here. So the first one is Enchanted Ballistics. This increases the accuracy and reload skill of all your allies in a radius when you use it. Uh, you can use it multiple times a battle. This is very important on the Vampire Coast because although they have strong range units, they're not necessarily the most accurate and they have a decent reload time. This solves a lot of that problem. Uh, it's worth using early game before the enemies close to get your long range units to be able to do damage. Uh, and basically, you want to use it whenever you get the chance. Further on, you get Powder Keg. This is quite an important one. This improves your more powder ability. You can use it on a unit, and it will replenish their ammunition. You can use it like five times. This is very good on some of your low uh, ammunition unit, bomb throwers, and some of your artillery. If left alone to fire long enough, they might run out of ammo. This allows you to keep them in the combat and keep them shooting. And then the next one is a passive and is almost always worth taking almost immediately. It, any allies in the area do more damage at range and they armor pierce. This is, of course, being a ranged faction is amazing to have. And you should have one or two of these in every army to try and get the biggest benefit to all your ranged units. Um, you also get some very nice defensive ability and cooldowns as well. Now down here... Um, he reloads faster. He gets this blunderbuss, which is interesting. Ruins the range, but you fire multiple projectiles at once with more damage. All told, you fully improve it. It just increases your damage, doesn't ruin your range. This makes this guy a really good unit killer. Um, specifically, like uh, infantry units, he can blast his way through advancing infantry regiments and even range damage because he outranges most of the enemy range units in the game. And then once he does gun sight, he can improve his range even further, um, making him almost a portable artillery unit with tons of uh, armor piercing damage. It's worth bringing, and you can even throw him on a rotting Promethean as well if you want to have fun. Um, it's quite amusing to see how strong this unit can be. Um, it's a very worthwhile addition. I recommend getting access to it and sticking at least one in your army early on. Okay. On to the economy. So the Vampire Coast economy is strange. So we'll go over units and then we'll talk about how to actually, uh, sorry, buildings and then how to actually make money. So first off, the Vampire Coast desperately needs their garrison um, to protect their settlements. It's not the world's greatest garrison. I still recommend building it wherever you can for the walls and to deter enemies from taking your settlements because you might not have a lot of settlements and uh, making the enemy pay for every advance is very, uh, very much a necessity to defend your realm. Standard anti-plague buildings. Honestly, I don't really bother about this for the vampires. Get the garrison, though, and your minor settlements. The next one they have access to is their growth building. And this is rather a unique growth building. First off, it gives control as well as growth, uh, meaning your, building, your settlements grow quickly, but they don't revolt as much and we can send him a hero success. The top one is probably one of the most unique things in the game, just in terms of building um, concept, because it lowers the leadership of enemies in the province who are laying, laying siege or encircling you. It's not the world's greatest debuff, but it is a nice little top, because approaching an area with tons of people swinging from the gallows would be very disturbing. 
it's worth throwing down in all of your settlements early on, and it's even worth keeping around late game for that leadership debuff as well. Next one here, you have what is apparently a growth uh, income building. Um, it's not a growth building, sorry about that. The income is neglectable, so don't even think about it. Its big thing is it provides six control. Combined with the pirate gallows, you get nine control, meaning you build both of these, you should have no public order problems. The reality is you should be able to build the pirate gallows and have no income problems, assuming uh, no income and public order problems, assuming you've spread vampiric corruption to the province. Honestly, I don't really build these. Maxed out, they spread more control if for some reason you're struggling with vampiric corruption. The next one is your vampiric corruption building. Uh, it doesn't have the world's greatest spread of corruption early on, but fully built out. It spreads corruption to the adjacent provinces. Be aware that four, though, is relatively low um, in terms of corruption growth. It has problems fighting basically anyone who has corruption reduction, but it is a nice little boost, and it does corrupt your province fully if you build one or two of these. It's worth building in your major settlements, one of them. Otherwise, don't build in your minor settlements. The benefit really isn't worth it unless you need the corruption. And finally, this is the minor income settlements growth building. 500 gives you 100, five turn payback. 1500 gives you 200. That is a seven or eight turn payback period. These are rather pathetic, low level income buildings. Can be worth throwing them down if you feel the need. But the reality is building a garrison, building a growth, and maybe a corruption problem, you've already filled out all the buildings in your settlement. And 200 income. Well, it does allow you to upkeep some of the more basic vampire units. It won't allow you to upkeep even one of the high-level units. Now, let's look at a major settlement's income buildings. So first off, the Vampire Coast has is a top-tier port faction, meaning they get most income from ports you can get up there with Norska. Um, they get 800 fully upgraded. Growth, recruitment, they also get a garrison. Um, it gives you bloated corpses early on, which is very powerful. Honestly, if you get these, it's worth upgrading because you'll get more money from ports um, everywhere. And all told, you own four or five of these, you're going to be making tons of money. The problem comes from defending them, which is where you need the garrison buildings. So this is a legendary settlement here, so we don't actually have a garrison building here. Um, Otherwise, these are the same buildings as in the minor settlement, with the exception of the plunder pile, all told, built up. I already talked about it earlier, but it gives you 300 gold. And once you've got three of them on the map, you can then use the Curse of the Bountiful Treasure to gain more money. Every 15 or so turns gives you a good chunk of cash. Now, all of that told, that is not how you make money as these guys. You make them through either the pirate coves, stealing um, income from the enemies, smugglers' coves, or Picaroon's hideout, or you make them through another method, which I will talk about here. Periodically, the world will throw up um, stuff in the ocean. It will throw up various islands. Quest They're basically mini like quest battles that you can find stuff in the ocean, loot, and get benefits from. That is how, in my opinion, you're going to make most of your money from the Vampire Coast outside of raiding and pillaging. You have bonuses to fighting at sea if you try to build them up. Plus, you get a massive amount of movement range, all told. If you focus on this bonus, you'll move 30 or 40% further than anyone else. So you can rocket around the world collecting sea treasures. And considering early on that you're really going to have one, maybe two armies, it's quite possible to max max mass up around 40 or 50,000 gold in the first 20 or 30 turns just from raiding or doing sea battles. Uh, sea battles are going to be the big source of your income. It's not abnormal for the Vampire Coast to be running a deficit for a good portion of the game um, up until you either own enough settlements to support it or you get more of the uh, pirate coves scattered around the map. And that's fine. You should be able to gain enough money either from raiding or raiding is also another good way of making money for these guys. Um, obviously, be aware that it does weaken your combat stats, but the big income source is really from the ocean treasures. 
considering how fast you can rocket around the map, it's worth having one lord basically dedicated to finding sea treasures at all times. Uh, maybe your first uh, legendary admiral, or even your starting ruler. And uh, you should have really no money problems. The only problem I ever had really with money with these guys is when I upgraded to the final level and had to fund all of these top level buildings because they are expensive. Um, is very, very powerful at generating money, this faction. Um, this should be one of the least income problem factions you can have. Just be aware you're really not designed to sit at home and build up like the vampire counts. You need to be out exploring and fighting, even though your army might not be the best in actual combat. You have advantages. You can run away. You can ambush. You can strike where they're weak. If you go to, say, take White Peak, they move their army down. You just simply sail up and take their settlement, or you sail way past them and raid here. You can outmove basically anybody in the game with one or two exceptions, which makes these guys highly mobile, highly corruptive, highly good at raiding, pillaging, and finding stuff at sea. And that is how you make money as these guys. Okay, technology. So the Vampire Coast um, is pretty much, their tech tree is unlocked from the beginning. The one exception is, as I mentioned, these legendary admirals, which when you can afford them, you pretty much want to get them. Outside of them, you have a variety of which ones you want to pick. I tend to pick this disreputable admiral because he gets a bonus while defending and then use him to defend my capital. But if you want to go on offense, this guy is pretty good because he provides physical resistance to his full army, um, which is a big buff. It's the Vampire Coast. Now you've got three different ones, Command, Firepower, and Salvage. Salvage is one of the ones you probably want to hit first. Um, first off, gives replenishment to your base infantry. Then it gives you access to such stuff like spread corruption, raise dead cheaper, spell resistance, supernatural regeneration, in my opinion, should be one of your first targets. 10% casualty replenishment in all your armies, combined with salvage crews and the Vampire Coast's already decent regen and healing spells. Um, you should have no trouble regening most of your army in two to three turns. Now, the rest of these, obviously, you want to use them when you're specializing in them. This physical resistance for your large monstrous constructs are really nice. But there are two down here I really want to mention. This first one, Spell of the Necromancer's Apprentice, gives a ward save of 20% to a unit. And yes, you can stick this on your, your lord units. It is worth doing. Um... All the Vampire Coast Lords are decent in combat. This just makes them extraordinarily stronger. Um, they don't become one Lord armies like some of the other factions, but they're no longer squishy, and they can easily decide the battles. Um, throw them into combat, they don't die. Or you stick it on something like a Morngul Hunter, uh, Haunter, and let them go nuts. Further on, and this is when you want to snag early on, Ship's Carpenter decreases construction cost for ship buildings allows you to get your um, various ships of your lords built up faster. Now, be aware that only your legendary lords and your legendary admirals have shipbuilding. Your other lords are like northern, normal armies. Um, I figured I should point that out now, just in case people are confused why they raise somebody and go, wait, I don't have shipbuilding on this guy. Nope, they're just a simple normal army. Um, but once you get Ships Carpenter, you can basically max out your ships with low cost and relative ease. So now you have the Command Crews. This is probably the second tree you want to touch into. Provides leadership for your base units. But the big stuff is it provides is other faction benefits. So it gives control to all your provinces, which is nice. Cheaper construction cost. Both of those are worth snagging. Protection Racket. Once you get some ports, this will make you a lot more money. Quartermaster, if you're going to raid for money, this is always worth getting. Plus 50 is huge. First mate is really good snagging early on. Plus 10 leadership makes your vampire units and specifically your zombies stand up a lot longer in combat. Seascape artist is a massive benefit, especially on your lords with shipbuilding. who will get that plus 30 range from their buildings, plus 10 from this, and plus 5 from their blue line. You're almost looking at half, again, movement speed bonuses. 
uh, if you do the um, Force March, you can rocket across like a quarter of the map in a turn. It's pretty nuts. Outside of that, Unliving Labor Force is worth snagging at some point. Uh, the Vampire Coast does not necessarily have the fastest building. This helps a lot with that. And up top, you have Sentries in Command and the Converted, which are buffs to your Lord and Heroes. If you're going to recruit one of these Legendary Admirals, it's worth getting Sentries in Command first. That way they'll start at level 5. Um, really, it just allows you to skip their basic training. On the heroes, it's quite nice, making them stronger. Now, Unliving Reflexes is worth getting 100%, especially if you haven't unlocked the highest level um, monstrous constructs. This makes your mob and your other general infantry units way more tankier. Once you get this, they will hold a front line, even if they won't kill the enemy. Uh, they become hard to hit. Uh, in general, even high-level infantry will tr struggle to kill your depth guards with this bonus. Raise the masses. It's a nice little growth boost. Honestly, though, it's pretty much neglectable. Marines, cheaper of your cheaper upkeep of your cheap units. If you're struggling with income upkeeping them, you're doing something wrong already. Serrated harpoons gives you a bonus to large on your polearm units. Can be useful if you're fighting cav or enemies with monstrous units. Otherwise, not amazing. It is a nice little damage buff, though. Pirate's code. Makes your lord's recruitment cost way cheaper. If you're losing enough lords that you need cheaper up recruitment of them, you're doing something wrong though. So it's pretty much neglectable. It does help a little bit with their startup cost though. This one right here, bonus to infantry for your uh, mob units. Basically, this is anti bonus to large. This is bonus to infantry. Problem is these guys aren't really going to be able to kill uh, the enemy anyway, and for some reason it buffs your gunnery and your deck dropper mobs, which already are absolutely terrible in melee, so it doesn't solve their problem there. Pirate Scum, get a better recruitment rank. Honestly, pick the ones you need. I do recommend trying to get Seascape Artists and First Mate and Quartermaster early on so you can raid, move around, and your army fights better. Dominion over Mortals is nice to solve any public order problems you might have. Um, and undead, unliving reflexes is worth snagging because of the increase to melee defense. Now, down here, firepower is what it sounds like. This buffs your range units, which as the vampire coast is your strongest unit. First one, buff to your really weak gunnery mob units. But then after that, things get interesting. So throwing bombs gives a huge bonus to large for your faction. Powder monkey. Um, applies to your whole army, gives armor piercing damage. Honestly, though, it's kind of neglectable, considering it only buffs two units. Master Gunner, on the other hand, is a little bit better, gives more range, but again, it only buffs two of your weaker units. Steel Forge Shots, though, is amazing, buffs your already strong Necrofex Colossuses and makes them stronger. Steadier Aim gives you range, but again, only to those two, which is disappointing. This one, better recruitment rank, always good to get. Magazine, more ammunition for your artillery, always good. Um, oddly enough, it boosts deck gunners, but hmm, it's still useful. Stolen Imperial Ordinance is really good, gives you range. Unfortunately, it's still only a buff to those two units anyway. Ammunition bonus can be worth snagging. Uh, less effective than, say, magazine on the units you're putting it on, but still worth grabbing. Black powder oxides increased missile strength on an already relatively weak missile damage unit. It does improve it on rotting Prometheans and some of the others, but overall is kind of avoidable. Clean your bores is worth getting, though. Makes your upkeep for your artillery cheaper. And maintain cannons buffs your um, artillery units. Honestly, out of these, um, there are some that are worth snagging. Steel Forge Shots is good once you get Necrofex Colossi. Trained Gun Hands Magazine Maintain Cannons and Clean Your Bores are about the biggest buffs you're going to get to your artillery units in the game, and it's worth snagging. Throwing Bomb can be very useful to buff a hero or a um, entity unit um, just to make them stronger in combat. Putting on the Morangle Hunters or... Uh, if they're fighting Cav or your deckhands when fighting Cav, makes a huge difference. Overall, 
it's not one of the world's greatest tech trees. It still doesn't solve the problems the Vampire Coast have with actual melee combat and holding a line. But if they can keep the enemy off their range units, they will obliterate them. It's honestly a shame that so many of these only apply to two units, neither of which are the world's strongest. Um, if it was to your artillery, that would make them one of their strongest factions in the game. And that is the tech tree. So on to starting lords. Since we're here, we might as well talk about the Dreadfleet and Count Noctis. So Count Noctis's capital is the Galleon Graveyard, uh, which is a uniquely strong settlement. Um, it's called the Maelstrom. You can build it up. It's got pretty good defenses and a reasonably strong garrison. Gives you good income. Starts with a port, all told maxed out. You can support almost a full army from the Maelstrom. Uh, it obviously has access to the plunder pile, which is worth throwing down. I will mention the fact that while you can get the Great Altar of the Necrarchs to get the Necrofax Colossus, Colossus, it's not worth building as Count Noctis. Instead, you want to get the Wreck of the Hel Helden Hammer, which is basically his flagship, uh, which unlocks the recruitment as well and generally buffs all your artillery units. So don't build this as Count Noctis. Build this. It gives you the exact same thing, but it's better. Uh, overall told, it's worth throwing down Dredge the Sea on this to do the recruitment and then pretty much just sit back and let this build up. It's not one of the highest attacked provinces, but be aware that Tyrion lurks to the north in Lothran, and he loves to declare war on you and invade with two armies. Tyrion alone can take the Galleon's Graveyard. A second army is a pain. So just keep an eye on the sea. It's worth sometimes rapidly raising a lord, using the um, raised dead to put a full army into it and deter the enemy. You can always disband the army once they retreat. So Count Noctis starts up here. Obviously, we're five turns into it, um, just so I could demonstrate more mechanics. You start with the gunnery white outside your army. Add that to the army. Fight your initial battle. You start at war with Kalidor and um, Tyrannok up here. Make sure you raise your dead before you fight the battle, so you take less casualties. Basically, raise everything. Fight the battle. Uh, you're not going to be able to take Balls Anvil initially, so your best bet is to sail to Avanthir or to Tor Sethai. Um, raise more units. Remember that you can encamp and build up your ship. At sea, you have a unique uh, expand flagship stance. Uh, on land, you need to do encampment. Once you do, keep upgrading this. I recommend casualty replenishment, recruitment, growth, and then basically get some unit uh, buildings that give you units. Keep raising the undead. Take Sorth of Thai and um, Avanthir. If you want, you can push for Toll Anrock. It's dangerous to do so because it exposes you to more of the inland vampire... Uh, High Elves, which love to fight the Vampire Coast. If you go south, taking Vol's Anvil is very possible with an ambush and your starting units because you have siege attack. You might need a second army. I am very wary of taking Vol's Anvil, in all honesty, because once you do, Tyrion almost inevitably will declare war on you. Taking Lothran is a great goal if you can pull it off. The problem is Tyrion wrecks your army and... Unless you bring two armies in ambush while he's outside of Lothran, it's almost impossible to take this area. If you do, then you can proceed to dominate Ulthwan, keep an eye on the Slanesh factions, and be aware the Dark Elves invade at some point. But up to that point, once you breach Tyrion, Alariel, and um, uh, Eltharion the Grim are really your only other threats in the area. Um, Lothran is the big prize. If you don't take Lothran... The other option is you just don't invade this area at all. You just pack up your ships, fight the initial battle, and sail away. It is very viable. As Noctis, you can go pretty much wherever you want and fight. Just be aware that keeping the Galleon Graveyard alive may require an army or two to prevent invasions from the High Elves. But going to Ulthwain basically means you're committed to fighting an Ulthwain. Um, if you don't, there's a possibility that uh, they won't constantly be attacking. Overall, though, your goal is to fight here. Your victory conditions are quite simple. It's get 8,000 infamy. Be aware that every legendary admiral you recruit costs you 2,000, which slows you down. 
Uh, sacking, looting, occupying, or raising settlements is really your only condition. Uh, it's extraordinarily easy to do as the Vampire Coast. Don't worry about getting these. You can just literally raid and pillage entire coastlines and uh, accrue that. Further on, to complete this, 25,000 inf infamy takes a little bit longer. Uh, but overall, it doesn't, there's no expand, wipe out any factions as this guy. It's very simple. Just conquer lands or raid it and get infamy, which, by the way, is your goal. So setting up pirate coves early on will help a lot in that goal. So Count Noctilus is rather interesting. His actual factions bonus gets war declaration missions with rewards. Basically, it gives you a bonus. Uh recruitment, income, etc. for a certain amount of turns. He gets a bonus in relations with the followers in the gash of the Tomb Kings, um, so long as they stay alive, and they sometimes do, but most of the time they die. Uh, it's a good trading partner and an ally defensively. Be aware that they're going to pull you into a lot of wars down in Nekahara. Thankfully, you don't actually have to go help them. He recruits more through his pirate crew, um, basically his ship, and gets cheaper and fat oh he gets faster recruitment of the necrofax colossi and his actual stats are kind of interesting he's not the world's best fighter um he's okay and he's very defensive he's more of a spell caster um his traits here up 20 percent cheaper upkeep for necrofax and increased weapon strength of 15 which the necrofax colossus count as so basically you can do that 19 army of Necrofax plus Count Noctis and actually have a strong and reasonably cheap army. So to start off, he's got a pretty typical blue line for the Vampire Coast. Movement range, get this lovely plus six replenishment rate. You can either do cheaper recruitment or loot from post battles. If you're going to raid and pillage, this is good. I recommend Sea Dogs though. Huge bonus to sacking and leadership while fighting at sea. If you're going to do the travel around fight uh, ocean encounters, this is worth putting it on. It also helps with defending your land because you will be the strongest at sea outside of the Dark Elves with their black arcs. They're a real threat. Thankfully, they don't hate you as much as others. Go on account is nice. Cheaper raise dead is really handy as well as the recruit bank and capacity. Further on, this varies if you've got access to shipbuilding. If you do, you get living ship, growth, cheaper recruit. Construction cost. You can do this if you're struggling to build up your ship. Honestly, though, I tend to ignore it. Get combing preservative, cheaper upkeep. Gambler's wit here for defensive if you're fighting Skaven. Otherwise, lightning strike is very handy on this faction. Since you struggle fighting more than one army at a time, the ability to do lightning strike when there's enemies around is really handy. And finally, the black flag, more movement, cheaper upkeep, better recruitment rank, and cheaper raised dead cost. All told, you can make raised dead like 35 or more percent cheaper, which is really nice. So you've got a pretty standard red line here. The difference is Avasti and then all hands ahoy. Buffs to combat and leadership only affects melee annoyingly, um, but is quite nice. Has a decent range, but not huge. Basically, if you need to lose this, use this ability, you're probably already in a bad position. Um, all told, if you're struggling with a defensive line held together by screws plus the tack, you can get an additional 11 melee defense to your base infantry. Um, your defensive line will hold much longer. Further on, we've got bonus in ammunition and missile strength to your low, low, low to mid-level range units. I don't tend to take this much. Black Powder Overlord, more ammunition and damage for your artillery, always good. Rotting Death, this is a buff to your elite uh, constructs, specifically the Necrofax Colossus and the Rotting Leviathan. The physical defense and melee defense is huge. Since they're already powerful units, this will allow them to actually fight and kill things in melee. Haunting Horror, if you're going to use monsters, um, Terror guys or sirens can be useful. Honestly, though, it's almost too scattershot of a skill to be very useful. Drowned and bound, if you're going to be using loaded corpses, additional speed, Morngulls and animated hulks get stronger. 
At the top, though, Deadly March, if you can get this on your depth guards, they get way more tanky and they can actually kill things. But honestly, getting stuff like Ensorcelled Weapons, Missile Strength, and Armor and Spell Resistance on all your range units, basically, and your artillery is huge. Um, and Hardened by Death, if you're using Necrofax Colossus, is worth getting. Weapon Strength, Spell Resistance, and Melee Attack. All told, though, wait on the red line till later. You're much better off going down blue and then shifting up into the unique one. So Count Noctilus, better recruitment rank of Lords, better replenishment and recruitment capacity. All told, you can stack some crazy casualty replenishment rank, which is great. Vandal, growth, better sacking. It's nice. Long Karstein's lines is really handy. Um, regen makes him way stronger in combat. Plus the terror is nice. Sea Curse buffs your depth guards, which all told as Noctis is definitely something you should be used to hold the front line. A army made up of some depth guards backed up by Necrofax Colossus under Count Noctis is really strong. And the Invincible Fleet Makes him unbreakable, meaning he fights to the death, and his army has more leadership. Outside of that, he has access to the Lucky Charm, giving him some more um, missile resistance. All told, 30 is pretty nice. More hit points, but the big benefit here is he can ride a Necrofex Colossus, complete with all the ranged damage it entails. Now he's a legendary lord on a giant hulking thing. It is a debuff to his combat strength but it's a buff to everything that matters. The health points alone are worth it. Now, he has access to a pretty standard uh, yellow line here. Monkey Jacket is worth mentioning for the Vampire Coast. Ward save is really nice. Honestly, you can buff him so he becomes a very powerful fighter. It does help alleviate some of the penalties you get if you stick him on the Necrofex Colossus. You can make his Colossus really good in melee combat. He has access to taunting enemies, which weakens their defense and speed, making him very good at actually killing enemy lords. Um, and finally, Hornswaggle is basically a stronger version of taunt, weakens the enemy. But the big thing Count Noctis does, if, unless you choose to make him a melee fighter, is he casts spells. So he has initially access to healing and a damage spell. It's a combination of the Vampire Coast spells and uh, vampire ones, as well as this Mystifying Miasma. Curse of Undeath is worth getting because it heals all your units when you cast. This one is an increased bonus to your healing. It, this is very handy at the end of a battle when the enemy is routing, but you haven't ended a battle to get your troops together. Cast this on them. Um, they will be almost full health for the next battle, so you don't have to wait. Drown Dead is really handy. It allows you to summon mobs to defend you. Which is quite nice. The withering is just a weakening. Evasion is always good. Um, video of access to smoking mirrors. I don't recommend this one. Uh, speed 10% is not the world's greatest buff. Pit of Shades, handy area effect damage spell. Throw it on the enemy when they're engaged in melee combat and you'll wreck a lot of them. Wind of Death is your standard um, wind spell. Sends out an, an a expanding area effect. Use it on the enemies when they're fighting. You can get some kills, and then their standard healing. Now, his quest is kind of interesting. Captain Roth's Moon Dial, inc massive increase to movement range. All told, this guy can get like 65 or 70 movement range. And the Moon Dial allows you to summon a unit. It's not the world's greatest quest battle, but the movement range and campaign line of sight really helps with raiding, pillaging, and finding sea, sea encounters. And that is Count Noctis. It's up to you. Go for Ulthwan or travel around the map and be a buccaneer pirate. On to the next lord. Okay, here we are as the next one. This is actually a lady though. Aranessa Salt Spite. Um, basically blessed by the god of the seas, supposedly. Um, she starts over here in the old world, uh, making her the only vampire count coast to start there. She's down in Sartosa which is just to the south of Skaven Blight and Bretonia. Uh, overall, one of my favorite starting locations. If you want to play a pirate that goes raids and pillage, she's probably one of the best ones. You start at war with Talea to the north, with Miragliano being their capital. 
Uh, you can expand up and take Miragliano. The downside of doing so is now you're committed to defending your lands. You've got ogres to your east, dwarves to your north, skaven to your west, as well as beastmen. Uh, it can turn you into a bit of a land fighting. On the other hand, this land is more defendable than some of the others. You've got large provinces enemies have to march through. And all told, there's not a lot of legendary lords that are a huge threat. You can sometimes get non-aggression with the Skaven. If you do, that protects your west. and You can just have to deal with the dwarves at some point, usually. Or the ogres. On the other hand, as Aranesa, you can simply fight this battle, take Lucini, establish a cove, set it to spreading corruption, and then just retreat to Sartosa. What that will do is, Talia is not the most aggressive faction. Um, there are minor factions. They don't tend to be as good as a legendary faction. Uh, all told, if you can corrupt their lands and build a corruption brush building in Sartosa, you'll corrupt most of their province, and they'll be so busy dealing with uh, uprisings and attrition, they tend not to be able to really attack Sartosa. Uh, it's also a deterrent for enemies in this area, because this is a very long province here. So you'll corrupt both provinces, making it very hard to get to you, especially if you use Curse of the Sea Mist. Basically, you can defend Sartosa without having to have an army there, which allows you to free up Aranesa to go raid and pillage the world. Now, her victory conditions, she has to destroy Count Noctis over here. Um, for some reason, that's her mission. He doesn't have anything to do with her, but you have to destroy her, which is not particularly hard. Um, you can go and travel over to the Galleon's graveyard pretty early on and steal that before he's defending it. And let if he has no Galleon's graveyard, he tends to die to Tyrion in Ulthuan. And uh, you don't have to deal with anything up there. You start again with a Gunnery White, stick to your army. Make sure you raise your dead, fight the initial battle. I recommend throwing down the cove unless you're committing to land fighting. Now, the Vampire Coast is better at land fighting in Total Warhammer 3 than it was in 2. It's still not at strength. Sea combat and range with elite infantry and constructs is its bonus. Now, let's look at Sartosa. So Sartosa has access to a garrison building, unlike the Galleon's Graveyard, because it's not a unique settlement. It's worth throwing down the wall settlement the garrison here, these walls, as well as upgrading. All told, you can have a very powerful garrison. Since you're in your own little area, it will be corrupted completely, meaning any enemies that land will get attrition corruption, sea mist corruption, and first off, most of them will have to mark through here, because landing on Sartosa is a little bit harder than you'd expect. It's mostly cliffs. They can land right next to your settlement, but a lot of enemies will march in. So other unique things about Sartosa, it's unusual in that it has three uh, unique landmark buildings. Peg Street Pawn Shop, if you manage to get a trading partner, you can make a decent amount of money from this. Honestly, it's neglectable because the odds of you getting many trading partners are slim. Honestly, uh, your best bet is the other Vampire Coast factions, where there's three of them and you want to destroy one of them. Uh, if you can get an alliance with the Skaven, though, you can actually make money off this trade. But honestly, I would neglect it. The next one, Smithy's Tavern, is really good. Uh, you want to get it, control and income, meaning Sartosa. You don't have to build any public order buildings, and you make decent money. As well as the casualty and uh, local recruitment is nice as well. The big benefit is the Dragon's Tooth Lighthouse. It allows you to see all sea regions, allowing you to find um, treasures at sea. Those great sea encounters and enemy fleets much easier. And you also have a resource, which Thorny Orchard. I do recommend you throw it down early on. Um, the 10% decreased construction and the recruitment cost is rather handy at the beginning of the game. You can destroy it later once you get everything built. Uh, this is also one of the ones where the corruption building combined with a vampire cove spreading corruption um, will put a massive amount of corruption into Talea's land. So you don't have to deal with too many invasions. You get a strong garrison, you build up. I recommend starting with getting an artillery building and probably either the Thorny Orchard or the walls. Probably Thorny Orchard. That way you get artillery and it's cheaper to build stuff. Definitely throw down an edict. Dredging the sea is where you want to get. It's better built up. Overall, Sochosa is a pretty nice settlement. I like it better than the Galleon's Graveyard. 
it gives Aranessa the ability to leave without feeling like her capital is going to be destroyed because Tyrion isn't about to show up on your doorstep. So let's look at Aranessa's unique stuff. First off, she has horrible relations with Norska. Um, it's just the way it is. Better at raiding, sacking settlements, and she has an increased chance of finding treasure maps. Be aware that she does start with a treasure literally located right next to Lucini. So taking it will give you a huge boost of income and infamy at the start. Uh, and then you can kind of go wherever you like. So Aranessa's is the Queen of Tides. She gets a bonus to leadership when enemies in her or her allies are in their aura. And she gets a big boost to Sartosan units and weapon strength. So what is Sartosa units? Well, that is kind of a unique thing to some degree for Aranessa. Let me get out of this first. So Aranessa has access to different units in the rest of the Vampire Coast, mainly Sartosan units. She has Sartosa's Free Company. These are a buff early on to your infantry. Be aware, though, that they can rout and run away. Uh, but overall, pretty good. As long as they've got good leadership, they have perfect vigor and have more leadership, meaning once they start wavering, they're going to rout pretty quickly. But overall, are much better than your deckhand mobs at fighting. These can actually kill things in melee combat early game, which is nice. Late game, they fall off. Um, but they're decent for what you get early on. You also have access to the Sartosan Militia, which is a similar to the Empire Militia unit. Half decent in range combat, half decent in melee. Overall, use it before you get access to your better range units, and then it's obsolete whereas the free company might be worth taking for a while. It's not as defensive or tanky as the zombie units you get access to, but you can actually kill things, so it's a trade-off. Those are her two unique buildings and she uh, units, and she buffs them. Um, she doesn't get access to them very easily otherwise, though. Oh, her ship is apparently called the, um, the Pirate's Current, in case anyone's curious. And you can recruit Sartosa from it immediately. Uh, she's got no unique buildings, so let's look at her skills. So, standard blue line, same thing for Count Noctis. Get the replenishment, get the sea strength, get the increased, uh, decreased cool, uh, Upkeep costs, the increased recruitment rank, and the decreased raised dead costs were snagging for her. Standard re uh, red line here, the biggest difference really for her is that she does not go as heavily into Necrofax Colossuses as Count Noctis does. Doesn't mean they're still not good for her. So it's take the stuff that boosts your elite stuff, although you can build up your default infantry units, including depth guard, but she does have the Sartosas, meaning it's less of a necessity early on than it is for the other vampire coasts. Pretty standard yellow line. Uh, it's actually pretty good to take on her. She starts with a good amount of physical resistance, and all told, she can get pretty close to a one-woman army if you buff her completely. She has access to this rather unique chain here, forger, smuggler, poacher, and arsonist. Other vampire coasts get some of this, but big thing for her is it buffs her Sartosan units, um, meaning if you're using them, you'll get increased combat ability, weapon strength, and everything else, and can be worth taking early on, as well as a buff to raiding and stuff as well. Her unique line, she's a mutant, so she gets increased hit points and perfect vigor. This makes her significantly better in combat. The ability to not fatigue means she always runs and fights at top speed. Sawfish, peg leg, more armor and weapon strength. This is a huge buff to Sartosans, rotting Prometheans, and rotting Leviathan upkeep and missile resistance. She specializes in Sartosa and obviously rotting Prometheans and Leviathans, meaning use those. I still recommend the Necrofax Colossus, but you can try them out and they're pretty good. Movement, replenishment, and leadership for Sartosans. All told, your Sartosan units start at Tier 1. They can get them up to about Tier 2, maybe Tier 3 infantry units. Self-Toss Gunner. She gets barrages for her ar the various army abilities and more ammunition. Uh, this is very powerful because um, normally you have to build buildings to get access to these abilities. 
she gets access to them. If she builds the building, she gets even more abilities to use them. And your worst nightmare, increase wonder from encounters at sea, faction-wide, a ward save, and a melee attack. All told, she can get 10% ward saves from skills on top of her physical resistance. I will note, Swashbuckler, upgraded, gives missile. Um, I think there's another one here. Nope, that's the only one that gives a big buff. Her quest is kind of interesting. More raiding ability. She's really all about raiding and pillaging. Increased combat ability and Kraken's Bane. Uh, buff to your allies' combat ability. All told allows her infantry to be able to kill things, mainly her Sartosan units. And the weapon strength in melee attack means, all told, all upgraded, she can become a one-man army or one-woman army. Rotting Prometheans uh, is worth snagging, gives her a giant crab. It does weaken her melee attack, but combined with her quest and other upgrades, she can strengthen that. It's not, I would say, one of the top tier lords in the game in terms of combat ability, but she's definitely in, like, below S tier. She's A rank uh, in terms of actual combat. Uh, and overall, she's a very fun lord to play. I like her. I think she has the best Vampire Coast experience of actually being a pirate, mainly because your homeland is relatively safe. Be aware, you can have some trouble with uh, uh, whatever the Crusading Bretonian Lady is down here. She can sometimes come raid you. Uh, Greenskins and Ogres can sometimes give you trouble, but you can get a surprisingly large amount of non-aggression packs early game if you work at it. Getting Clan Scryer, even if you have to pay them early on, is worth it. Keeping them off your back, they will cause havoc to your north, leaving you free to just have to deal with Talea and the Ogres early on. And overall, have fun. She's a great faction to play. Go raid, go pillage. Feel like you're playing Pirates of the Caribbean, but Total Warhammer 3. On to the next Lord. Okay, here we are with Silostra Dire Fan. Oh, Silostra from Total Warhammer 2 has migrated from the bleak coast or from down in Lustria here all the way up to the region near Nagaron here, the monoliths area. Uh, all told, I think it's a decent change. The downside is it throws you into land combat. Uh, unlike all the other vampire coast factions, you basically have to fight at land rather than raiding and pillaging. Uh, luckily, Silostra is probably the best of the Vampire Counts lords for that. So we'll get into it. First thing to note is she has a Damned Paladin, a legendary um, hero. This is a immense buff for her. This unit, all told, buffed out. Um, it's 20% ward save or more. He can wreck the enemies. He's massive physical resistance and ward save. He basically becomes a one-man tank and should always be in your front line. Robert. Bartholomew. Um, he's basically a damned Bretonian lord. And he's pretty simple. Keep upgrading his stuff. Be aware that he does give a replenishment rank, which can be worth snagging. But all told, I would focus on upgrading him rather than replenishing troops. Seriously, that ward save is absolutely nuts. He's very strong. Um, he's very good at what he does. He's always worth keeping around Siloistra. All told, it's a huge combat buff. For her army. Now, she gets a bonus in loyalty when you recruit new um, lords. And Cyrene and Morngul, both which are um, ethereal type ghost units, get a reduced upkeep and recruitment cost. She's all about making her army resistant in melee physical damage combat. The downside is her armies tend to be weak to magic damage. So, the first things to do for her. Obviously, recruit the full army if you can. It's got a good stack to start with. Fight this battle. Start taking these lands. Twisted Glade and Black Forest are your goals. If you want, you can go up and take Monoliths. Be aware, then you're starting to approach Aleth Anar over here. And you're getting closer to the Nagaron lands. Now, I don't love her start because Hotek's Column is extraordinarily vulnerable to invasion. Very short path in. This is a province that demands uh, a garrison and a lord nearby to defend it. You can commit and push out and take this whole area. It'll give you several ports, good income, but then you're committing to defending and fighting on land for the whole game. 
Otherwise, you can take Hotex Calm, Black Forests, fortify them, and then you can get back to raiding and pillaging at sea. Sorry, Loistra, on the other hand, has some bonuses to fighting at land. But let's finish up here. So your big threats to the north. Um, so you've got Alathanar to the east. You've got Malachith to the north. You've got Beastmen to the west. Uh, if left alone long enough, the Sisters of Twilight tend to even come after you. All told, you're surrounded by enemies. You really have no allies whatsoever. Um, it is possible, if you work at it, to get some non-aggression packs with the nearby Dark Elves. And I do recommend you get it early on. It's a nice, um, nice influx of cash and protection. The downside of doing so is that these guys are going to get killed early on. And the factions that replace them are going to be hostile to you anyway. So just think of it that way. Uh, she's got standard shipbuilding. Obviously upgrade what you will. I do recommend a little bit more focus into vampiric corruption and replenishment than the other vampire uh, coast lords. Mainly because you need to corrupt this area to get the full benefit of uh, your defensive abilities. And to make it easier to expand. So let's look at Siloistra's actual skills. Some of these are very interesting. So the first thing you'll note is she's 60 physical resistance, meaning even though she's not the world's best fighter, she is extraordinarily tanky for a uh, legendary lord, especially if they don't have um, magic attacks. She has Siren of the Storm, which enables magic attacks on her whole army, meaning her whole army is one of the strongest ones in the game, backed up by the fact that you get physical resistance in the whole army. Now, in my opinion, this doesn't solve the Vampire Coast's other combat problems, but it's probably the single most impactful trait or ability in the game in terms of making an army stronger. Uh, the physical resistance is massive. The magical attacks mean you can fight anybody on an equal footing. She's got a standard blue line and a standard red line. Uh, it's worth noting that you probably are going to want to do some more drowned and bound than some of the others, uh, sorry, Haunting Horrors to boost your Sirens and some of your other uh, units. There's no easy early game buff to um, bind both the Sirens and the Morngulls. So you need both Haunting Horror and Drowned and Bound to buff the two units that Silostras focuses in. Honestly, though, I wouldn't agonize over which one to take or which one to focus in. With that additional physical resistance, her whole army is better. She's kind of best generic vampire coast one, plus her paladin makes her even better. Now, she's got access to the lore of the depth here, which is the vampire coast lore, buff to accuracy, damage to the enemy when you cast spells. All told, she gets a summoning of rotting Prometheans worth taking. Fog of the dam weakens enemies in an area. Kraken's pull can be pretty useful. Oddly enough, this seems to be messed up. Uh, Kraken's pull is decent damage. The area effect, Vargeist Revenge, can do some substantial blasting damage as well. But the big stuff for Silostra are her unique stuff. So she gets a Rotting Leviathan. Once you get it, it's worth putting her on it. Uh, it doesn't weaken her combat abilities at all. Um, overall, it's a buff for her in her starting stuff. So her unique lines here, and there's two of them, Ghosts of the Past allow her to summon Damned Knights Errant. Um, these are Bretonian knights she's enslaved to her servants. So we'll go over here. They're right here. They are an actually good cav unit for the Vampire Coast. They have massive, massive physical resistance. They do take damage over time when they are uh, fighting because they're summoned, so they do degrade. All told, you'll want to be summoning these in every battle. It gives a surprisingly powerful buff to her army, the ability to hunt down archers and anything else at range, as well as have a pretty good physical resistance frontline cav unit is really nice. She can proceed to upgrade that with Slaughter in the Deep. They get stronger. Watery Graves, they get stronger as well. She gets to summon more of them. And then she has a choice at the end. She can do Sacrilege, where she gets Questing Knights, or she can get another Damned Knight unit. All told, I like the Questing Knights myself, but it's up to you. The Questing Knights are better than the Damned Knights Errant, or even the Damned Knights of the Realm, which you can get. Uh, they're a stronger combat unit. 
they're not as much shock cav. They don't have armor or shields, but they have better melee stats, which is probably what, to be honest, you're going to be using them to do is fight in melee combat. So all told, I like the questing knights myself. And remember, everything gets physical resistance just for Silostra being there. On the other hand, be aware that the weakness, of course, is magic attacks, which will hit your ethereal units, as well as spells. Now, she's got another unique line here from the depths. Um, she gets access to this pretty early on, so it's worth upgrading it. The summons make her army, which is already good with the paladin, even better. But from the depths, cheaper raised dead, recruitment rank. She gets more access to the Morngul Haunters, which is really nice because they get buffed from her abilities and they kind of follow her whole ghost thing. Fiery Diva, it's cheaper and faster to overcast spells. It strengthens her decent spell casting ability even higher. Emerging Terror, any bloated corpses you have, they're basically free and a physical resistance buff to your ghost units as well as your corpse. Honestly, the buff to the corpse is neglectable, but the Sirens and Morngul Haunters it's really strong on. And finally, Sirens of the Storm, better at casting spells. So she's the spell caster of the Vampire Coast Lords more than anybody else. Um, but she's also pretty good at combat with that um, physical resistance. Just be wary of any lords or units with magical attacks or that have spells that can give their units magical attacks because they can absolutely wreck her. Um, she also has this Song of Enthrallment, which she can use. It's a hex to weaken them. Um, she has access to Tide Call and Spiteful Shot at the beginning. And that's Silostra Diaphan's skills. Her quest is kind of interesting. I'm not the biggest fan of it. Uh, control, Magic Item Drop, Corruption, Base Miscast Chance. Eh, they're all kind of neglectable. Honestly, the control's the best. Her passive ability just allows her to cast more spells. That's pretty much it is. It's probably one of the most neglectable vampire uh, Coast Lord quests. You can kind of ignore it. Her victory conditions are to gain the first shanty verse, then the. Um, oh, she doesn't have to gain the other ones. It's just get more infamy. This is pretty tricky to get in some sense. You need 8,000 to summon the enemy army. They'll declare war and tend to come after you. Then you kill them. Again, Silostra is probably the most combat oriented of Vampire Coast, so it's easier her, for her to win those than others. Try and keep your enemies that you're fighting at a minimum and unless you're willing to commit to a long drawn out land war don't expand too much early on wait for the enemies to come to you then counter attack whereas if you attack too fast you might overextend um, you really need access to her late game ones the mangrove of monsters is going to be your big focus for the sirenes as well as the morngols and at the top the rotting leviathan uh, still, Necrofax Colossus on her is still really good. Uh, but just look at these wonderful Sirens. 60% physical resistance. It's so nice. And that is Sir Lester Diaphan. Uh, one of the, I think, the hardest of the Vampire Coast starts. But she has the potential to actually win land wars more consistently than the others. So that's it for her. On to the last one. Okay, here we are as the last Vampire Coast lord luther harkon so you start here in lustria very similar to where you started in total warhammer 2 the map has changed slightly i think it's somewhat to your benefit um considering your starting area has been reshaped so you can easily gain control of it whereas before it was slightly harder um and uh initially you're fighting vampire coast mutineers so you're one of the few Vampire Coast factions to fight another one. Uh, it's worth killing them off. Once you kill them off, you've got some new enemies you're fighting. To the south, you've got Lizardmen. And to the west, they will declare war on you probably around turn 10 at the latest. And uh, they will attack you. And beyond that, you'll, Itza will come after you as well. Which means you're going to be fighting a defensive battle for quite a while. And you can expand slowly to your north. There is the Aquintaine Errantry faction. Um, they will be coming for you as well because they hate vampires. So you're going to be fighting two strong enemies, both to your west. Thankfully, you're at the end of a peninsula, so you're pretty hard to attack from the sea. Uh, to the south, you have Skaven. It's worth getting a non-aggression pact with them. Um, 
Clan Pestilence tends to be willing to do a defensive alliance with you. I would take it if you get the chance. They will solve a lot of your land problems. Your goal is to restore Harkon's mind. Um, but the reality is your goal is to conquer a lot of Lustria and in general just not die. Um, it's quite possible to get overrun by this guy almost more than the other Vampire Coast factions. Outside of maybe maybe the Dread Fleet if uh, Tyrion comes for the Galleon's Graveyard. But um, let's get into it. So you start with a Gunnery White, add it to your army, raise the dead, go fight Hawk's March. You're probably going to lose a good chunk of your army fighting the battle and then the settlement. So build up, take Talax. You want to take Talax pretty early on, and this will be your stronghold. Getting Talax to level 3 with a garrison building should be a priority. Don't start building a garrison building unless your army is there, because the enemies take advantage of that and will try and declare war and attack your settlement before you can fortify the border. Ox March is pretty safe. Uh, you are going to want to upgrade it and garrison it, though, to make sure you don't lose your port. The Awakening is a powerful settlement. It is worth throwing a wall settlement uh, building in it almost immediately, in my experience. Um, once it's got a garrison in it, it, the enemies pretty much don't attack it. Uh, it's one of the stronger uh, settlements in the south. Then uh, it doesn't have the world's greatest defensive capabilities because the enemy will just sit here and then attack you. So the garrison makes it a lot tankier. Now it's got a unique landmark. And this is one of the few landmarks in the game with a negative effect. You can build it in one turn. It weakens your spell resistance. And it gives you miscast and weakens your winds of magic don't build this as soon as you can build it save it to your level five and can build the upgraded version which is the ancient vault which is a huge buff to your army and more importantly it's part of your quest which is to restore your mind how you restore your mind you build this all the way told and you complete his unique quest battle slan gold which will be a quest at level 12 don't fight it at level 12 your army probably can't fight it but build it up, take it. And in fact, restoring and winning a short victory with Luther is actually really easy. You don't have to expand that much. All you have to do is loot, occupy, and raise 30 settlements, which you can do in Lustria and the nearby areas. Restoring the mine is actually relatively simple. Plus, makes it easier to raise your dead and weaken enemies spell casting. Luther has no ability to cast spells, really. Uh, outside of his base ones, so the ability to weaken enemy spell casts is nice. So, his unique stuff. He's got a bonus with the Fallers and the Gash, making them a good ally trading one. Obviously, you have a penalty to the Vampire Coast Mutineers, but since you're at war with them and want to conquer them, it doesn't make a huge difference. Lords and heroes are more defensive, and, oh, the Lizardmen hate you. And guess what? You're on a continent with mainly Lizardmen. Enjoy. So, Luther's stats himself. He's the Grand Arch Commodore. Vampiric Corruption in his lands. He gets a bonus while fighting Lizardmen, and his army gets a huge buff to Spell Resistance. He already starts with a nice amount from that, and then Spell Resistance again, he can get 45 or more Spell Resistance. He does have, unfortunately, a um, effect that is not detailed here, but we will talk about it. His mind is shattered. He's insane. Um, he's got multiple different personalities, and periodically they will take control. When they do, they will either sometimes lock you off from spell casting, they'll weaken his leadership, they'll give you access to spell casting, um, et cetera, et cetera. There's quite a few of them. You can't control it. You have to play around them. Uh, until you restore the mind, you're going to constantly have a variety of effects. Um, thankfully, um, they're not either super debilitating or they provide a nice little buff to the point that it is kind of fun to play around. He's got a standard blue line. Recommend Ghost Fleet. Probably Sea Dogs is not as big of an importance as him, so Binded to Service can help. Go on account. Uh, living Ship is really useful for him since you're going to want to be expanding out the ability to rebuild your army as you do so through your ship is really handy. Combing preservatives and black flag, of course, are just great bonuses. Uh, since you're going to be fighting lizardmen, held together by screws, the additional melee defense and leadership can be really strong early on. Um, specifically, later on, the buff to the depth 
guards with halibards will help you deal with the Bretonian faction to your north. Obviously, it's going to take you time to get depth guards. Um, you just have to endure till then. But once you get it, you can absolutely wreck that Bretonian faction if they're still alive. Uh, you've got a pretty standard yellow line. Monkey, monkey jacket gives you a ward save. It's worth throwing a point into when you get the chance. All told, Harkon is a decent melee fighter. He's probably the strongest melee fighter outside of Aranessa, but she requires a lot of buffs to get there. Be aware that his various uh, mines can weaken him, but all told, he can pretty much double as an almost um, one-man army, considering he starts with a range attack that's pretty good as well. Um, you build that up, he can kill people from range, and then he can survive in melee combat. So he has access to the Hunger, which is worth taking, Supernatural Horror. These are all stuff that we saw under Aranessa. The difference is you don't have Sartosa's units to buff, but they're still worth snagging. All of them are pretty good. And um, specifically the one here that buffs your artillery is really worth it. Now, his unique line is he's got a Fractured Mind, so gives him more leadership and combat ability. Uh, it turns him into quite a melee powerhouse combined with the uh, yellow line here to the buffs. Man of War allows him to get better fleet captains and makes your depth guard defend better as well as your deck hands, but you shouldn't be using them that much. Um, basically, this guy's about depth guards to some degree, so having that helps. He's more resistant to spells. All told, he can get like 60-70% spell resistance. It's pretty nuts. Hand Cannon. This is interesting. Now his bullets explode, which does additional damage, and he buffs um, venery mobs and rotting Promethean missile damage as well. Moment of lucidity, he gets more armor melee defense. It's nice to make him that much more tankier. And then the Pirate King, his entire army is cheaper to upkeep, and he gets a global recruitment capacity. Now he gets on a Death Shriek Terror Geist, which is kind of like the dragon of the Vampire Coast. Uh, gives you access to a breath attack, basically, missile attack. Makes him pretty tanky, hard to kill, all told. It's a pretty good buff for his combat abilities. It does weaken his attack and defense, but you can overcome that through the yellow line and his traits. All told, very powerful lord, probably outside of RNS of the best melee fighter, but he will kill at range, and that's it. He does not have spell casting because he is basically due to his shattered mind, a magical void. On the other hand, his army's takey against spells, which is really nice. And restoring his mind feels like a really nice accomplishment once you're done. So take your initial region, fortify it up, slowly expand. If you can strike early, killing off the Bretonian factions, nice. Be aware, if you do kill off them, Marcus Wolfhart's to the north, and he hates you as well. Um, the Lizardmen tend to be aggressive early on, especially if you build garrisons in your settlements where you don't have an army sitting in them. So if you start building a garrison, stick your army there first. It'll prevent some war declarations. Um, these guys right here aren't the threat. The threat is Itzel further down will come for you as well. Skaven can be your ally. Other than that, you kind of just have to hold out in your little area. If you can corrupt the nearby regions, it'll make you a lot more defensive. The problem is, in order to do so, you basically would have to build this corruption building in two or even all three of your settlements. And that takes up some of your slots. Since you've got a port here, garrison, corruption, garrison, corruption, and then another building arms your income. I'd be very wary of taking Luther to sea, though, um, mainly just in this short area around them, because as soon as you leave, the enemies know that and they tend to pounce. And that is it for Luther Harkon, the kind of flag bearer, the <laughs> flagship of the Vampire Coast. Pretty strong. Uh, just be aware you've got a bit of a defensive gameplay style for quite some time. Okay, and that is it for the guide. Thank you guys all for watching. If you enjoyed it, please do leave a like, comment, and subscribe. It was a lot of work. Uh, it's nice to hear that people appreciate it. And I hope you enjoyed it, and I will see you in another guide, Let's Play, or something else. Uh, I have a Discord, as well as a pretty active community page on the YouTube channel. I'll see you guys all then. Bye for now.